Take a look at this picture. This is the Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, meeting with President Xi Jinping of China in September 2023. In the last 10 years, they've had at least five different meetings to discuss politics, diplomacy, and economic ties. These trips saw ties between the two countries grow even stronger to an all-weather strategic partnership. But Venezuela is just one of the many Latin American countries that China is courting. Even though thousands of kilometers separate them, China became Latin America and the Caribbean's second largest trading partner in 2021, with almost $450 billion worth of goods exchanging hands, up from $12 billion in 2000, almost a 40-fold increase. So why is China so interested in the region, and does this flourishing trade come at a cost? Since China's accession into the World Trade Organization in 2001, external trade has flourished, and the country has built up a notable presence in key industries crucial to Latin America, such as mining, telecoms, electricity, and energy. China's economic relationship with Latin America takes on three forms, trade, official foreign direct investment, and bilateral loans. Why do you think Latin America is such an attractive investment proposition for China? It's many of the same reasons that had driven Chinese engagement with Latin America really even two decades ago. Uh, Market-seeking behavior as China looks to export a much wider range of goods now of much higher value, uh, technological goods, for example, and services. In addition to that, there's resource-seeking activity. Trade in commodities in particular has underpinned uh, the relationship for, for, again, over two decades. And in Latin America, China is looking for soy, above all, to address what is a fairly critical food security challenge at home. Uh, the region also plays an important role um, in China's broader energy security calculations, and that's one reason why we see China continuing to engage with Venezuela despite the many challenges there. China also invests directly in key sectors through investments, mergers, and acquisitions. Between 2005 and 2020, it invested more than $130 billion in the region, including $60 billion in Brazil, $27 billion in each of Peru and Chile, while Argentina received $12 billion of Chinese ODI. From 2000 to 2010, most Chinese investment in Latin America went into the extractive industries, into mining and oil in South America mostly. The Belt and Road Initiative starts in 2013, and what you start seeing is a lot of loans from Chinese policy banks to governments in the region that are used to hire Chinese contractors to develop infrastructure. The Belt and Road Initiative is a vast infrastructure and development project with the original purpose of connecting East Asia to Europe. The project has since expanded to Africa and all the way to Latin America. In 2022, Argentina signed a Memorandum of Understanding with China, which means that 21 out of the 33 Latin American and Caribbean countries have formally signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative. This changed the nature of investments in the region. Before 2013, more than half of Chinese overseas investments were in the basic material and energy sectors. Since then, these investments have diversified to include consumer goods, financial services, industrial goods, telecommunication services, and utilities. Signing into the Belt and Road Initiative is a way of gaining um, diplomatic favor from China or being on the right side of things with China. Of course, this brings some controversy when it comes to the US and Europe. What about the economic impact? Has there been a discernible economic impact for, for these countries, the ones that decided to join the Belt Road Initiative? Uh, yes and no. Uh, there are countries that are not part of the Belt and Road Initiative, which have received significant loans from China, significant investments, and others that are part of the Belt and Road Initiative that are not the center of attention for Chinese investors. The Belt and Road Initiative as a diplomatic campaign has had uh, an impact, but as, uh, in terms of its economic impact, it hasn't been so profound. The Belt and Road Initiative did, however, spur investment into logistics and infrastructure. This includes strategic ports. The U.S. State Department estimates that Chinese state-owned companies are involved in around 40 port infrastructure projects from Mexico all the way down to the southernmost tip of the continent in Ushuaia, Argentina. Along the Panama Canal, for example, which is one of the world's busiest waterways, Chinese company Hutchison manages and operates the ports of Balboa and Cristobal, located on both the Pacific and Atlantic sides of the canal. 
While Hutchison only operates the ports, Washington is increasingly uncomfortable with the Chinese presence as around 60% of goods passing through are destined for the U.S. China's state-owned shipping company Costco is also the majority owner of a new port project in Peru, the port of Chanque, which will offer a deep water port for container ships making the trip from South America to China. Beyond infrastructure projects, China has also poured money into politically sensitive areas such as ports and space. In 2018, for example, China started operating Espacio Lejano, a deep space ground station in a remote area in the Nukan province of Argentina, consisting of a 35-meter diameter dish. The station's stated aim was peaceful space exploration. However, the facility is managed by an agency which reports into the Chinese military, and suspicions have grown that the base is being used to gather intelligence. It has little or no oversight by the Argentinian government. There is a space uh, uh, station of, the, of China uh, with uh, military personnel, uh, Chinese military personnel. So we, we are entering into a new phase of the Chinese-Latin uh, America relationship. It's not only trade, it's not only commodities, but also a, a, a presence that is becoming uh, very uh, important in, in technological areas. Critics therefore worry that China's interest in the station goes beyond commercial interest and could help facilitate China's military and civilian ambitions in space. This comes as it also looks to increase its footprint in key telecommunications sectors. China or Chinese private companies have taken key stakes in uh, some sensitive sectors like telecommunications. How should we read that? China uh, views its capacity in telecommunications and ICT, but also in wide-ranging innovation-related sectors and industries as being absolutely fundamental to its future growth prospects. You know, that's Huawei, that's ICT, obviously that's 5G, but that also includes things like high-speed rail, um, you know, cloud computing, a lot of AI-related things, energy, uh, renewable energy in particular, these things that require some high-tech inputs as, as being fundamental to, to its prospects, to overcoming what economists call the middle-income trap. I thought it was interesting that when the U.S. applied a Huawei export ban, that Latin American countries didn't follow suit. Why do you think they hesitated? It all comes down, I think, in this particular case to economics. Uh, Huawei is able to offer its equipment, especially for 5G, these small cells, right, at such a reduced cost that for countries that are coming out of the pandemic or are struggling to, to manage high levels of debt at the moment and have many other objectives that they're pursuing. Along with selling its tech to South American markets, China needs the continent's critical raw materials such as lithium, copper and nickel, which are essential for making batteries that ultimately underpin the green energy transition. It is estimated that up to 60% of the world's lithium reserves are located in the Lithium Triangle, a region that includes Chile, Argentina and Bolivia. Lithium and copper-rich Chile is a good example of China's presence. Chinese mining firm Tianxi holds more than 20% of Chilean chemicals and mining firm SQM's shares, and China itself has been Chile's largest trading partner and export market since 2009. It doesn't stop there. China has been actively engaged in emergency financing to countries in financial distress, typically the purview of multilateral development banks such as the IMF and the World Bank. Since 2005, China's state-owned policy banks have lent $136 billion to the region and distributed 123 loans, notably to Brazil, Ecuador, and Venezuela. These loans typically carry lower interest rates than countries could access in public markets and are often accompanied by different conditions. For example, Chinese loans are sometimes granted to those that agree to hire Chinese infrastructure firms. The loans are also denominated in yuan, which serves the twin purpose of facilitating payment in China's local currency, while at the same time reducing the need for creditor countries to use U.S. dollars. It also means that when countries run into trouble, as in the case of Bolivia and Ecuador, they are at the mercy of Chinese creditors. When countries are struggling economically, can they even afford to push back against China interests? Most Latin American countries have... Uh... Uh, very serious debt uh, with uh, with China, and we will we will see what are the consequences of that uh, very intense and complex relationship. And the Western countries haven't haven't reacted uh, in a manner to give alternatives uh, to the present uh, situation. And this is also something that uh, must be thought 
by Europe and, and, and the US uh, on how to deal with the matter because uh, uh, the, the limits of Latin American countries uh, um, are quite intense and, and, the, and the alternatives very limited too. Indeed, since the 2008 global financial crisis, American companies have moved away from the region. We saw not just U.S. companies, um, but, you know, a lot of other companies and partners exit the region. And that includes, you know, uh, companies from Latin American countries, which, you know, in many cases divested from major projects. This created uh, major openings, very large openings for Chinese companies to come in and invest in strategic sectors. Venezuela is a notable beneficiary of Chinese loans. In 2007, it entered into a loan for oil agreement with China, getting money in exchange for partial oil payments. The weight of U.S. sanctions and economic and political troubles domestically caused its oil production to dwindle. China was obliged to grant the country a grace period to repay its debt. Ruben González Vicente says that since then, the Chinese have been more discerning about lending. China, Chinese policy banks, started to reevaluate the loans that they have given in the region and beyond. Between 2021 and 2022, Chinese policy banks needed to renegotiate loans for a value of 52 billion US dollars. And this was problematic. These were loans that were not being paid back, that were not turning a profit. Venezuela became a big example of what could go wrong if you give huge uh, loans to a country that is not performing very well economically. So I think this is being rethought and the focus is now more on smaller loans that uh, have been through proper due diligence rather than big loans that only have the guarantee of a sovereign government telling you, yes, we are going to pay it back. Ultimately, as China's ambitions grow, it will continue to rely on key natural resources from Latin America. And as long as Latin American political leaders welcome the investment and trade that China offers, China's influence will continue to grow.